Dr. Adi, how are you doing today? I am doing well, thank you. You are, um, who actually coined the term basal whisperer? Somebody must have given it to you, right? Because uh, somebody told me that's what they call you, and I don't know who they is. Um, but how did that come about? What do you think? I honestly don't know. Um, I think uh, I, I, it started with a, a little fame of, uh, of other people knowing who my patients are simply by looking at their basal rates in their pumps. If you look at their <laughs> basal rates and you see that there's more than six or eight or 12 different basal rates for the day, you know that's Dr. Adi's patient because nobody else does it. <laughs> All right, so um, we put out the call um, to, to see how we can use Typepool to facilitate some successful basal testing. The thing I wanna keep in mind here is that um, we're not here to talk about a specific patient um, and like we're gonna change this from 0.5 to 0.48. Um, part of your process is obviously to uh, incorporate different suggestions and things like that, but we're not here to offer medical advice. We're here to offer guidance on um, how you can use Typo to facilitate those medical decisions with your patients. So I want to be clear around sort of where we're going with um, or how far we're going to go here. Like Typo is obviously a tool to facilitate these medical discussions, but we're not here to address specific patient needs as they may come in. So to the audience out there, please be uh, judicious with that Q&A button as we go forward. Uh, Dr. D, I know you had some slides prepared. I'm going to stop talking and let you control the show. Uh, well, thank you, Christopher. Uh, and uh, just to you know, reiterate again, we will be using some examples of real patients. I'm going to show some slides without you know, the names, and, and, but we will talk about the ages as examples and guidelines for what to do. And, and I want to clarify one other thing before I start my, my screen, which is uh, I know we wanted to talk about, you know, basal testing, and we're going to probably redefine basal testing, I, and I'd like to call it more of basal optimization than actual basal testing. Basal testing is more like uh, a tool that one can use, but perhaps um, not always. Maybe there is a, a better way to do that. So let's dive right in. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm going to uh, try to talk in and share the screen at the same time. Um, keynote, basal rate, let's do this one. And, and we're gonna go to play and let's see how successful that is. Uh, works, uh, Christopher? That's we are good see the to screen. go. Very good, all right. So uh, thanks for uh, joining us today, everyone. And uh, uh, like I said, we're gonna talk about basal testing and optimization and focus more on the optimization part than the testing part. Uh, and just a quick word about me, I am a pediatric endocrinologist, uh, currently taking a break from practice. I used to work at UCSF and continue uh, to collaborate and consult um, and doing some more consulting, but most of my effort these days is continuing to work with Tightpool as their chief medical advisor. Uh, on different aspects of what we do. Uh, so I'm a little biased uh, towards Tightpool. That's why we're gonna use Tightpool for all the data visualization today. Um, and uh, let's go over our objectives for today. Uh, you know, my focus is mostly in, on, on users of pumps and closed loop systems and particularly in children. I know there are great differences uh, in the way we, we set up the pumps and, and the basal rates and, and everything else in children versus adults. But I think that whatever we learn in children, and that's where my experience has been, is going to be certainly applicable to adults as well. Uh, and then we're gonna review some basics of basal rate, like what are basal rates and what they should look like, et cetera. And then optimizing basal rates and why bother optimize the basal rates. And hopefully I will convince you that it's probably one of the most important thing we do uh, for patient care is making sure that the basal rates are, are very good. Um, and then go over some guidelines and examples uh, to, to, to share with you. Uh, so basal rates, uh, the amount of insulin that you need for basal metabolism. Uh, the different definitions and how people, different, different people think about what basal rates are, but at the end, they all mean the same thing. Um, or sometimes some people refer to them as the minimum amount of insulin that you need, even if you don't eat anything all day. You still need some insulin uh, because your, your liver is still making glucose. So perhaps another way of describing it is that it is the amount of insulin required for covering all the endogenous glucose production, even if you don't eat anything from outside. 
etc. There are different ways of, you know, again, articulating what that is. But basically what the basal rate is or basal insulin requirement is something that you need even if, even if you don't need anything. All right, uh, basal rates are very important. Uh, they're important for the following reasons uh, and, and more reasons. I've just listed a few here. Uh, they make up actually a quarter to half of total daily insulin. So uh, just as a guideline, again, most people will say, will say that basal insulin is about half of your daily insulin, but it can certainly be a lot less than that in children. We'll, we'll go over that, uh, that information in a couple of slides as well. Uh, and, and about a third to half the day during sleep, uh, the, 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 the body is just running on basal rate uh, only. Uh, so if we can actually figure out and optimize the basal rate for someone, that's winning half the battle because half the day, they're just basal rate insulin. And, and if we can optimize that, then we're really you know, winning half the battle, like I said. And, and, and equally important is that many of the closed loop systems that are being developed are actually developed to be based on what the current basal rate settings are and then adjusting them up and down based on what the glucose data looks like. So providing a solid base of uh, pretty accurate or close to accurate uh, basal rates for the day will provide a, a solid base for closed loop system to work on and actually optimize their performance as well. So optimizing basal rates is, is important, uh, as I just mentioned, because closed loops will adjust the basal rates. So having a good basal uh, will provide a, a, a better uh, solid base for that. And then it also provides a safe fallback for open loops because any closed loop system is going to fail at some point and kicks you out of auto mode, if you will. It's going to be not functioning and it's going to go back to function as an, as a, as an open loop pump by itself. Uh, so when that happens, we really should have a good solid basal rate that's approximating what the body really needs to prevent severe hyperglycemia or severe hypoglycemia. So even when somebody is closing a closed loop, we still need to go back and pay attention to what the settings are and try to optimize them as much as possible because they are going to be needed at some point. And obviously, in my opinion, the, the, the more optimized the basal rates, the better performance will be for the closed loop systems. Uh, and we'll go over a few examples to illustrate that as well. And the reason I say this is that if we rely completely on closed loop system software to adjust, and I get this argument all the time, just like why do we even need to bother optimizing the basal rates? Because the closed loop software is going to adjust the blood sugar, adjust the insulin delivery based on the blood sugar. So we don't really need to worry about that. The software is going to take over. And my answer to that, actually, there is a great advantage of optimizing basal rates and making sure that they are working as well as they should, instead of relying completely on the software of the closed loop to adjust it. We want to rely on the closed loop system to make small adjustments up and down in the basal rate but not rely on them to make huge adjustments and struggle with doubling or tripling the basal rate or shutting off and we end up with a lot of zigzagging and blood sugars going up and down. And, and what I use here is proactive versus reactive because the closed loop system is a reactive system. It's looking for a change in the blood sugar, making a decision, changing the basal rate, and then waiting 60 to 90 minutes before you finally get that effect completed as opposed to when you're setting somebody's basal rate to be just right, you're actually taking a proactive approach, meaning that I'm anticipating what the basal insulin requirement is going to be in an hour from now. And I'm actually delivering that amount of insulin right now to provide what the body needs in an hour from now. So there is no lag in that uh, waiting for the effect of the insulin. And that's how we end up with a smarter, proactive approach, delivering the right amount of insulin throughout the day. There are a few facts that we need to remember when we're looking at basal rates and adjusting them and thinking about them. One is that basal rates are very variable. In every sense of the word, in every context, they're variable from day to day, from patient to patient, from age to age, even from hour to hour. 
visa rates change constantly throughout childhood. Uh, so in, for those of us who deal with children with type 1 diabetes, uh, you know, it's a constant battle, it's a constant challenge to keep up with the basal rate changes because we need to keep up with them all the time because they change all the time. Just because we, we think we, we get the basal rates set just right, they will work for a couple of weeks and after that they change again and we have to go, you know, start again, start over and just keep changing them. So, uh, you know, changing basal rates in my opinion when patients only come to the clinic every three months is not enough. We need to be reviewing their data in between the clinic visits every once in a while, as, as often as two to three to four weeks, and changing their basal rates again, and then communicating with the patients and making sure that we're staying on top of it. Highly individualized basal rates and vary from day to day. That's why what you learn from one patient may or may not be the same for another patient, the same age, same years since diagnosis, and same body weight. Uh, it's really individualized, and we have to work with each patient separately. But there are patterns. You know, I, I, I don't want to make it sound too complicated or too frustrating. There are certainly patterns that we can follow. Uh, and let's go over some of those, because those are important guidelines. So a couple of years ago, or less than a couple of years ago, the, the data uh, science team at Tightpool actually went back and looked at real life experiences of all the patients who donated their data to Tightpool, who upload their data to Tightpool as well. And we looked at the data from those patients, and I'm just gonna provide just a snippet of those just for the next four slides, uh, demonstrating what the median basal rates are for most of those patients at different ages who, that, who, uh, who upload their data to type. And as we can see, there's something that's very common right here, which is that basal rates typically, and again, we're talking about the median, not the, not the, not the mean, typically uh, right, run around 0 0.9 unit an hour for most adults and then it starts to decrease a little bit as they get older into the older group of 60 and 70 year old and 80 years old. But for most, most adults, it runs about 0.8 to 0.9 units an hour. That actually peaks at around puberty right here, 15 to 17 years old. Those are the patients who need the highest basal rate and they run around on, you know, again, on average for the median of one unit an hour. And they reach this peak here at peak puberty gradually starting with much lower basal rate during infancy and childhood of 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, et cetera, until you reach the peak here, after which it comes back down to about 0.8 to 0.9 unit an hour. Again, this is just a general guideline to sort of just guess where the basal rate in the ballpark, where the basal rate should be for each of these age groups. So if you're starting somebody on a pump, for example, for the first time, someone who is seven years old, sorry, I'm gonna go back one slide. Somebody who is seven years old and you, know, you wanna sort of just guess what the basal rate should be on average for that day, it should be approximating about 0 0.25 to 0 0.3 units per hour, maybe 0 0.35, depends on the time of the day. And then I just wanna say one more thing about this age group because we didn't have a lot of patients and I want to, you know, say that if we had to break this down into the one to two year old or zero to two year old, and then the three to five year old, we will actually see even a drop here that that's closer to 0.1 to, or even less than 0.1 unit an hour. And for the next slide, this is just the same data uh, uh, showing that the, 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 uh, the, the blue squares here being the median, but also showing the distribution of that data points for each one of these. For each uh, dark gray, that contains 50% of the data. And then for the light gray contains 80% of the data. And then they took out the outliers, the top 10% and the lower 10%. Uh, so again, showing that there's a wide distribution of what the basal rates are for each of these age groups. And again, going back to, let's say, for example, the 16 and 17 year old, it can be as little as 0.6 units an hour, but it could also be as high as 1.75 or 1.9 units an hour. It depends on their body size and depends on their, you know, their puberty and, and, and their peak hormones. 
And then for the next slide, uh, this is going to show similar data, uh, but in a different way, uh, showing uh, not only what the mean or the median actual basal rate is, but showing what the percent of basal rate compared to the total daily insulin. And, and again, we all think about, you know, basal rate being running about 50% or half of your total daily insulin requirement, which is very true, uh, again, in the young adults and older adults. And that continues throughout life being about 45 to 50% of your total, basal, total daily insulin being in basal insulin. But that's not true in early childhood. Again, that can be as little as a third or even, even a quarter. 20 to 25 percent of your total daily insulin can be in only basal rate right here uh, if we break this down into the toddlers group and then the older children preschoolers here being about a third and gradually increasing as they go until they reach puberty and hitting about 50 percent of their basal rate. And again, this is just showing the distribution, how it can vary, uh, again, in, within the same age group, uh, it can vary tremendously, and, and that's why it's highly individualized for each patient. It depends on their body size, it depends on their weight. If they're overweight uh, or obese, they can certainly have more insulin resistance, or the opposite, if they are very athletic, they can be more insulin sensitive and require much less insulin. And many other factors, of course, including other illnesses and other medications and uh, the amount of activity that they do. Uh, not to mention that we actually, I think, did not have a way to eliminate or screen out all those patients who are using closed loop versus patients who are not using closed loop uh, in this study. And also, we did not, we could not tell whether somebody is using in diluted insulin. Uh, so, but even though that those numbers are small, so they sort of got um, buried in this group, and I don't think it affects the results very much. All right, here's another very, very important uh, sort of figure to remember and, and a slide that, uh, that's uh, from a paper published in 2012. This is from the German-Austrian group with their uh, uh, database that they looked at uh, their patients' distribution. They have, again, thousands of patients in here, and they broke it into four different age groups, uh, 0 to 5, 6 to 11, 12 to 17, and those who are 18 or older or 18 to 25 again, the young adult group. And what is clearly noticeable here is that this is hour by hour of the day. So this is midnight, this is 1 a.m., 2 a.m., et cetera, 6 a.m., and then 6 p.m., and then midnight back again. Uh, so looking by the hour of the day, we see that there is a variation in how much the basal rates require, how much the basal rates uh, used are in those patients that they have. And the pattern that we see for, again, looking at thousands of patients is that most people do require a higher amount of insulin right here that peaks around 5 to 6 a.m., which would we, you know, we all call the dawn effect, requiring higher amounts of insulin around 5 to 6 a.m. And then it decreases after that throughout the day and it stays lower during the day. And then what happens in the evening is that it starts to go up again. And for the younger children, the preschoolers and the prepubertal children, the important thing to notice is that their highest insulin requirement is actually right here after they go to sleep. This is much higher than the dawn effect. Uh, it's, it, 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 it's right here after they go to sleep. And then it drops back down here after midnight and then goes back up again for the dawn effect. Uh, and then for the teenagers, we see that, that the highest basal rate is actually right here at 6 a.m. and 7 a.m. And even though it goes up a little bit in the afternoon, but it's still much lower than the, than the peak in the morning. And this shifts from the highest basal being right here to being right here is a gradual thing throughout childhood. And it doesn't just happen all of a sudden before because they hit puberty. It's actually a, a gradual shifting of that peak from the evening time to the morning time. So keep this in mind because I think this is very important and I'm gonna show it in, in a slightly illustrated, slightly different way. And this is the prepubertal kind of pattern of basal rate running here at midnight to midnight. 
and then 6 a.m. noon and 6 p.m. And just in a linear way that the basal rate requirements would start here at midnight and be decreasing. And it hits a nadir about 1 to 3 a.m. right here. This is the lowest basal rate of the day. And then it goes up here at 6 a.m. as mentioned, and then comes back down and then pretty nice and flat for the day here with a little, you know, some fluctuations. But again, before in, in the puber in the pre-pubertal children, they increase their basal rate requirements tremendously right after they go to sleep right here. And then it starts to drop down again. And just to give you a little contextual data here of what this might look like for, let's say, a three-year-old or a four-year-old, for example, uh, just to, to illustrate how different this, these basal rates can be from 0 0.2 or 0 0.25 all the way up to 0 0.4. I mean, this is a tremendous difference if you think about it. You know, it's not, it doesn't sound like a lot, but between 2.5 and 0 0.4 here, is at least you know a, a 30, 40, 50 percent increase uh, change, and then comes back down here, and then look what happens in the evening here goes up to 0.5, and the challenge here is that it's you know it can be as high as 0.5 unit an hour here, and then within three hours it needs to drop down to 0 0.25. That's a 50 percent drop from 0.5 to 0.25 within three hours. And we need to you know, figure out how to do that and gradually decrease it here over time, but do it at the right time and at the right pace. And what the right time is, is also dependent on what time did this patient go to sleep. It's not a magical thing that at 8 or 9 p.m. Uh, that the basal rate needs to be high. It's all related to what time they go to bed and what time do they wake up. And we'll go over that again in a second. And here's what the pattern looks like in post-pubertal children. Again, that, that evening peak after going to bed is gone now. It's completely gone and shifted to a morning peak being the highest basal right here at 0 0.9. And again, just to sort of give you a sense of what the difference might look like, it could be as much as 0 0.6 to 0 0.9. Again, that's a 50% increase in basal rate right here and needs to be gradually happening over here to increase to, to reach the peak and then gradually decreasing to reach the 0.75 and 0.7 or whatever it is that basal rate that they need. And speaking of whatever that basal rate that they need, one of my sort of anecdotal experiences over time over the past couple of decades seeing patients is that Whatever we work out, the nighttime basal being adequate at around 3 to 4 a.m., this whatever the basal rate ends up being between 3 and 4 or 4.30 to 5, something like that, that actually is the basal rate that's going to work during the day. So if you look at what's happening at 3 a.m., 4 a.m., and if you think this basal rate is working just right at night, then that's a good indicator of what the daytime basal rates should look like or should approximate. So in essence, if we actually only look at the nighttime basal and optimize that and get it to work just right, we're gonna have a pretty darn good idea of what the daytime basal rate should look like. And we may not even need to do that so-called quote unquote basal testing for the day, because if we optimize the night, we're gonna have a good idea what the daytime basal should look like. And if we also remember the pattern based on the age of the child and the pubertal status, uh, once we figure out what this should be, we can then anticipate what this should look like. If this is a post-pubertal child, we'll say, well, it's going to be the same, 0 0.7, 0 0.75. And if it's going to be a pre-pubertal child, a six-year-old or a seven-year-old, if this is 0.35, that's working well. Well, it starts out here. If this is 0.35, then I can anticipate that this is going to be about 0.3 to 0.35. And I can easily guess with certainty or with confidence that this is not going to be 0.35. It's, it's going to have to be 0.45 or 0.5. And I would make those guesses and just start from there without asking the patient to say, well, you don't, you can, can you do a few nights without any carbs? I want to see what the basal rate requirements are. I can pretty much guess based on what's happening here at night. And never mind. Well, you, you got my point, and I think we just, you know, instead of going back again with the animation, so let's do that. Uh, but before we start actually doing anything and, and fussing with the basal rates, I think there are a few things that we need, a few information that we need. Uh, as I may have alluded to already, 
what is the age of the child? Well, of course, if it's your patient, you already know them, you got all this information, but let's say you're just looking at someone's data or you know, somebody's asking me a question about uh, you know, help with basal rate adjustments or setup even from the beginning. I wanna know the age of the patient. I wanna know the time since diagnosis, are they still in the honeymoon or not? I wanna know the current insulin doses, whether they are on a pump or on injections, what the insulin doses are, the long acting versus short acting insulin. Obviously, we've been talking about puberty, so we need to know the pubertal status. Are they in puberty? Are they peaking in puberty? Have they gone through puberty? Is the patient, the, the girl, menstruating or not yet? When did she start menstruating? That all gives us a very good idea of where we might be in that pattern of basal, in, 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 that, in that range of basal patterns. Which pattern should we follow? And then, all, obviously, as I mentioned, what time is bedtime and what time is wake-up time? You know. Somebody who stays up until 2 a.m. and then wakes up at noon the next day will not have the same pattern as someone who it will not have the same timing of pattern. It will be the same pattern, but it will be shifted a few hours to the right because instead of going to bed at 10, he's going to bed at 2. So we're going to shift that same pattern four hours to the right, but it will still be the same pattern based on the time of sleep and time of wake up. And then Again, remember the patterns. I'm going to say that many times because those patterns are super helpful in guiding you. And, and once you figure out uh, what the basal rate is, what the optimal basal rate is for a few hours at night, it's, you know, the pattern is going to guide you to what the daytime basal rate should look like. So let's, let's do some guidelines here. And again, this is, you know, some... Um, uh, some personal and anecdotal experience over the years, as well as, as, as learning from my colleagues and mentors uh, and learning from the published literature as well. And let's break it down into first for uh, you, those who are not using a closed loop system. Uh, so for those who are using a pump and a sensor augmented pump, so a pump and a CGM, uh, you know, we, we start with evaluating the basal to bolus ratio or the basal to total daily insulin ratio. Remember those graphs I showed you how uh, it's around you know, 30% or 25% or 50% based on the age group, knowing what the age of the patient is, and you can anticipate what the basal to bolus ratio should be. And then knowing what the current basal to bolus ratio is will give you a good guideline of where you should be working on. So if I see a patient on a pump who already coming in with 70% uh, basal on a normal diet, again, not a low carb diet, uh, but you know, a teenager uh, with 70% basal, clearly uh, we got to take a look at that and say, that's not right. Either you're not bolusing enough or that your insulin to carb ratio is not enough or your basal is just too high because it's covering your carbohydrates because you're not getting enough insulin for the carbs. Uh, so that is a clue already that the basal is too high and we need to make an adjustment. It's not about fine tuning the basal. It's about looking at the big picture and saying, there's something that's not right there and we need to fix that before we start fine tuning the basal itself. So there's no need, need to start thinking about you know, so-called basal testing. I think we need to figure out what the big picture looks like. Is your insulin to carb ratio okay? Are you bolusing for all your meals? Or if you're not bolusing, then let's talk about that instead of wasting time looking at the basal rates. Use the CGM data. In my opinion, without CGM data, you really cannot actually optimize basal rates uh, or anything else. Uh, and again, going back to the pre-CGM era, when basal testing was super important, and that's the only way that you can do it and ask the patient to check their blood sugars multiple times during that time, I think with CGM data continuously throughout the day and throughout the night and giving you all of that data, uh, we may not, and I'm hoping to convince you at the end of this hour that we may not need to do that, that, that so-called basal testing because the CGM data is, important, is, is informative. Uh, and then start with the nighttime because that's what I always do. Uh, when I see somebody's data, I first look at this midnight to 6 a.m. That is the chunk that is pure and clean with no food, no snacking, no exercise, no stress, patient is sleeping. Again, assuming that the patient is sleeping at 10. Uh, looking at that clean data, it's going to give us a good idea of just basal rate function and then start manipulating that basal rates and fine tuning it to get a good night CGM tracing 
uh, and, and, and without dealing with the carbs and snacks and uh, insulin to carb ratio and ISF, et cetera. So the nighttime is, is, is important. And again, remember the patterns. So here's a pattern, here's an example of a pattern. Okay, this, is, this may actually look a little fussy because, well, look, it's all in green. This is, so let me, let me orient you. This is, this is data from Tidepool, just taking three days in a row with the data it looks like at midnight again, because I start looking at midnight first. From midnight to 9 a.m., we're looking at the green being in range between 70 and 180. And if it goes above 180, it turns purple here. So this is all green and this is pretty darn good. And you say, why even bother do anything? And then the second day, it's all green again. And then the third day, it starts with a little high, but it's pretty flat for the day, for the night. So that's not bad. The basal rate is working just right. And then eventually, the, what, what I really notice here is that there's a trend here. Um, it's happening every single day. There's a drop here between 6 and 8 a.m. There's a drop here. There's a drop here. So there's a, a, a subtle trend that's happening every day, three days in a row. And I'm going to say, well, perhaps we should evaluate the basal rate right here. This is too much because it's dropping it. What we want is to stay steady for the whole night. We could do it for the night, and let's just keep doing it for the morning as well. This is, again, a patient who has not waken up yet, is waking up late, and did not eat any breakfast or take any bolus. This is all just basal rates. And what we need is just is to simply fine-tune that basal rate to make sure that we end up, we, we get rid of this slight rise before 6 a.m. and the drop after 6 a.m. That's happening consistently. And that's where we go and make some changes between 4 and 6 a.m. And I want to point out here one more thing, that if we're aiming to change this drop right here, which starts at 6 to 7, we're going to need to change the basal at 5 to 6 because that's the insulin that's working right here. So we don't go and change the 6 a.m. basal. We're going to have to go back to 5 a.m. And if we want to get rid of the 5 to 6 a.m. rise, we're going to have to change the 4 a.m. basal to make sure that we increase the insulin at 4 a.m., so that we prevent this rise from happening. And again, this is just an example uh, of, of, of sort of just fine tuning little things here and there, but it doesn't have to, it's not always this subtle of a change. Um, here's a slide that actually is, is here to remind me to talk about basal rate steps. And again, that, you know, as we mentioned earlier before we started that, you know, there are a lot of people who, who think it's really crazy to have uh, you know, eight different basal rates for the day and having these tiny little steps changes right here, uh, you know, going from the lowest basal at 1 a.m. to the highest basal at 7 a.m. and going through almost seven or eight different steps of basal rate here that's changing every hour, increase it a little bit, increase it a little bit, increase it a little bit. And the reason for this is that this is a tremendous difference between here being 0 0.9 unit an hour and here the peak at 1.8 unit an hour. And if you think about it, that's 0 0.9 to 1.8. The, you know, the body doesn't just wake up one day and say, okay, it's now 6 a.m. I need to change my insulin production from 0 0.9 an hour to 1.8 units an hour. It's a gradual change in physiology that's requiring higher and higher amount of insulin, gradually increasing until it reaches the peak right here because the hormones that causes resistance to insulin are happening gradually again throughout the night, not happening suddenly at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. or whatever it is. And that's why this is kind of an arbitrary thing, but it's mimicking normal physiology. You don't have to follow these exact steps, but the point is, if you're going this big change from 0.9 to 1.8, you should do it gradually. And we have the technology to do it. The pumps can actually make a basal rate for every hour of the day. So we might as well just divide it up and make this change gradually and, and do it. And, and it works, you know, it, you know, it works. We got a nice steady line for the whole night. Now, this, this didn't just happen. It took many, many tries and days and looking at basal rays. And this isn't just one fluke day. You can, I can guarantee you for the night, this happens you know, most of the nights. You know, there are going to be nights where things don't work out for whatever reason. Uh, but at least if, we, if I can get you know, three or four days of the week that look like this, that's pretty good. And again, winning half the battle. This is the nighttime. 
I'm not dealing with a teenager who forgets to bowl us for breakfast, and that's why she runs high here. And then she finally remembers here and, and starts taking her boluses, but doesn't correct. She takes the bolus for the carbs, but she doesn't correct her blood sugar. And because of that, we actually end up with an opportunity to look at what the insulin to carb ratio looks like here. 40 grams, she took eight units here, she's on one for five units. Uh, eight units for 40 grams without a correction. And guess what happens? Three hours later, exactly, she ends up right where she started with. She started here, she ends up here, suggesting that the insulin to carb ratio was just right. If she corrected it, she would have come back down further here, back into the green. But the fact that she, she did not correct gives us an opportunity to assess her insulin to carb ratio, and it worked. It worked really well. So we know that it's not an issue with insulin to carb ratio. This is an issue with just not forgetting to bolus for her meal or forgetting to correct when she's high. Uh, and the same thing happened for this meal that looks pretty okay again. And what happened here for the low blood sugar is that the fact that she was running high and got tired of being running high and being told you need to correct, you need to correct, and finally said, I'm just gonna take 10 units bolus right here arbitrarily. And she took a whole 10 units without measuring anything, just a guess. And that's why she had a low blood sugar right here. All right, next one. This should be an easy one. Again, this is a young man who is, I think, 18 or 19 years old. He's in college. And if we notice here, this is the midnight line right here, the white line in the middle. And after midnight, he's just, his blood sugar is just dropping, 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 all night steady. Uh, and this is his basal rate again. Okay, this is his, his bolus for his carbs. And he did a, an extended bolus. And that worked very, very well. He did an extended, a dual bolus for a heavy meal for dinner. And it worked really well. And then went up a little bit. And then after that, it starts dropping. Um, what this indicates or suggests at least that, that the basal rate may be too high for the night. And that's why his, his, his blood sugar is dropping every night. But we're gonna have to go and look at the next few days to see and make sure that the same pattern is happening. But before we go there, again, I wanna make sure that we are, that, that, that we are, we are remembering to take a glance at not only the nighttime, but there are maybe other opportunities to see what's going on here during the day and say, well, first of all, we comment on this dual uh, bolus here, how well it worked and he thought about it and congratulate him that this is working really well. Your insulin to carb ratio is working and your adjustments for the two hour extended bolus worked really well. But also we have an opportunity to look at the ISF here. Blood sugar is high, took a correction bolus. And in real life, actually, I can hover over this and it will tell me exactly how much insulin was given uh, in tight pool uh, and what the, what the ISF ratio was when calculating this dose. And you can see that, you know, here's the blood sugar. Exactly three hours later, it's back down here to about 80. So suggesting that the ISF correction ratio actually is working fairly well. And maybe if the basal rate is a little too high, it would have ended up a little bit too higher here. Uh, that uh, that this is a this is a, a combination of the effect of the bolus as well as the basal being too high, and that's why it ended up here. But again, an opportunity to make those assessments, not just looking at the nighttime basal, but also see if there's some some chance to assess something else in here. Now let's go to the next slide here. These are the yeah, basically four days of the week that the same pattern is happening, the same patient. That's the same one that we just saw. And then every single night, the poor guy is just dropping after midnight, dropping, dropping, dropping. And then finally here at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., he actually wakes up because he's low and it's alarming and he takes a snack, gets his blood sugar back up, and then it comes right back down again. And this is a classic example of just too much insulin because you treat the low, it goes up, and then it comes back down again. And the same thing here for the, for, for the fourth day. So clearly this is now a time where we have to make an adjustment. In fact, I would say, you know, to this patient, why you, if you notice this pattern, why didn't you call me earlier and say, I need, I need some help and just the data is uploaded so we can just take a look at it and make the change in here. All right. Um, and this one, is for pointing out 
opportunities for evaluating basal rates during the day as well. It's not just the nighttime. But again, if I'm looking at this at first, I'm starting here at midnight. And I'm saying, okay, what's the basal rate at night and what is it doing? So I take a look at this, for example, I see this increase here. If I see this and I look at the previous day and the next day and the next three days, and if I see the same pattern happening and I say, well, maybe I should actually make a change here. You know, this is now running a 1.4. Maybe we should increase it a little bit or do a little bit more insulin beforehand. This is 1.45. That should be 1.55, 1.6, etc. We make a guess and make some fine tuning to this. But generally speaking, this is pretty good. And the point I want to make from this slide here is this right here. Look what happened here. I mean, bolus for breakfast here and then bolus for dinner here. And there was no snack and no meal during the day. And the blood sugar just stayed more or less steady for the rest of the day. And then we have a chance here to look at this, you know, 2 a.m. to 6, 6, sorry, 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. time during the day. And not having to do the so-called basal testing because the patient did the basal testing by accident for us. And we see that the, that the CGM tracing is actually more or less pretty flat. And that tells me that this basal rate right here of 1.5 units an hour for the day is pretty good. And I don't think we need to mess with that. What we really need to say, well, maybe your insulin to carb ratio is not enough. That's why after you ate the meal, even though you bolus, you counted the carbs and you ended up being high, but the basal rate kept you steady for the rest of the day at the high, but it's steady. Uh, and what we need to work on is your insulin to carb ratio here. And here's another sort of accidental illustration of how that's 3 a.m. basal of 1.4 is the same as the daytime basal of 1.5 or roughly about the same. And in fact, if we increase this a little bit because we need to increase it because here there's a rise, this might end up being a 1.5 and the daytime is 1.5. So again, not a science here, but this is just an observation that was pretty consistent over the years with me is that whatever your basal here is going to end up pretty close to what your basal is during the day. Uh, I think you can see the picture in this one. This patient does not need any adjustments in basal rates or insulin to carb ratio. The basal rate actually is working very well. Unfortunately, he's staying in the 250 to 300 all day. He's purple. He has no green in the target range at all. And the reason is because he's a teenager uh, and uh, doesn't bolus for anything until finally at home at dinner time, his mom insists that, okay, you gotta put in your pizza, 115 grams. And guess what? It actually works after that. And he's, he's on his way to green. Unfortunately, we didn't catch it until after midnight. But this is, this is not a time to look at basal rate or anything else. We got to have a discussion about something else. And, hey, can we, we Dr. D, can we pause on this slide real quick? So I see sure. the slide title that says excellent basal rates there. When you see something like this, I, so from your mind, you can see, okay, like the line is relatively flat. Um, that indicates that the settings, at least for that time period, are okay. As a person with diabetes, I see my blood glucose is consistently high. How do you sort of balance that conversation of like, okay, we have valuable information here. Even if the results aren't what you want in the moment, long-term, there's an opportunity um, to identify like, here's something we can learn from this. Like, how do you sort of balance that sort of, the, the sort of mental struggle that comes with all this stuff? Um, yeah, that it, yeah, the that's a great point. With. Great point, Christopher. And I think, you know, one one thing, you know, is, is to try, and I think we all learn this, you know, to try hard to, sort of look at the positive part first. And you say, you know, what's, what's, what's good about this? The good, the good is that he's wearing his pump. He's running his basal. His basal is working great and it's keeping him out of DKA. Uh, even though he didn't boil us for anything until dinner time. This, I mean, this is 500 something blood sugar here. This is way above 400. Uh, and he's been over 400 for all day. And he got a little correction here. That's why he dropped down a little bit, but that's it. And he ate again. Uh, so, the positive thing about this is that he's doing all of these things and his basal is working well. Uh, so, um, you know, focus on this first. And, and, and to me, this is, you know, I, I don't need to, to, because he's not, this is the thing is that if he's not bolusing, 
then I, it doesn't matter what I do with the insulin to carb ratio or the correction ratio. It's just like it's not even being utilized. But what is being utilized is the base array. So that's the part that I need to actually make sure that I'm working on because he doesn't have to think about it. This is for me to think about and make sure that the base array is keeping him okay. And this base array is keeping him okay. It does not need to go up at all. And the other thing to point out here is, you know, again, Look how your basal rate is keeping you nice and flat here. All you need is just one bolus correction before bedtime. Just one. If you're not going to bolus for anything during the day, that's, you know what, fine. Just do me a favor. Before going to bed, just take one correction bolus because if that correction bolus drops you down into the green, you're going to stay green for the whole night. And that's 12 hours of the day. And that works. Does that, does that answer your question, Krista? It does. Thank you. Great. So now, how about those who are using, you know, can, can I have a time check, Christopher? Um, we're looking at about 13 minutes and 14, 15 questions that have come in so far. <laughs> oh, cool. Okay. Uh, guideline for those who are using uh, uh, closed loops. Um, you know, again, similarly evaluate the basal to bolus ratio, but it actually has a very different meaning when you're using a closed loop because the closed loop, remember, it's adjusting your basal rate. So it's no longer just your set basal rate. It's actually what the, what the system is doing is increasing your basal. And all of a sudden, if it's increasing your basal consistently, you're going to have way higher percent of basal to bolus ratio. Uh, and that's so, again, it shouldn't be that high. If it is that high, that means the system is having to adjust and give you more insulin uh, most of the time. So maybe what we need to do is to look at your insulin to carb do doses. That's not adequate. And we need to adjust those because the system is having to give you more basal rate. Uh, so it's a different way of looking at it in people who are using closed loop. You know, again, start with the nighttime closely dissect the CGM and basal block on a daily view. And we're going to see that in a minute. It will, it will make sense. Take advantage of the actual basal delivery. Again, that's going to make sense in a minute. And don't forget the patterns again. Okay, so here's one example of a patient who needs basal adjustments and more insulin to carb ratio. Uh, so this is the same thing. We got the CGM tracing here. We got the boluses here. We don't see the carbs, even I think because it's a little old from January, uh, but now we can actually see the carbs right here as well. So this is a patient who is using loop. This is the DIY loop. And these are the basal rates here. The dashed line here is the set basal. So for example, right here, this is the pump writing what the actual pump settings are. And anything that's above the dashed line or below the dashed line is what the automated system is doing, is giving you more insulin here or it's giving you less insulin here. This would be like zero insulin, completely shut off the basal, uh, and then increase the basal above the set basal rate right here. So with that, what we're seeing here, for example, again, let's focus on the nighttime right here. Nice and flat basal rate, uh, nice and flat CGM tracing here for the night and actually doing pretty good, but it's not because the, the basal rate settings are correct. It's because loop is doing its job right and it's giving you more insulin for these three hours of the night here. And if I look at this and I see this is consistently happening every night, then I go back and sort of calculate, okay, if, because when I hover over this again in real time, if I hover over this, it's going to tell me exactly how much it was delivering, how many units of insulin, you know, this is a uh, I think, uh, you know, scheduled to be about 0.35. And it actually doubled it like 0.6 or 0.7 and then reduced it and then increased it a little bit. And slowly just hovering over this, I get a pretty good sense of how much extra insulin it had to give on top of the set basal. And I just go back and make those adjustments in the basal rate. And I say, you know, your basal is not 0.3. It's 0.3 here maybe, uh, or even 0.25 because it actually shut it down for uh, 45 minutes. Uh, it actually increased it here to 0 0.5, 0 0.6 on average. So I make those adjustments gradually and then keeping, the, keeping those patterns in mind again, making sure that it's a gradual increase until it peaks at 6 a.m. and then it comes back down at 8 or 9. And, and we make those adjustments and we see how it's going to work better, hopefully, without having to work that hard almost every 15 minutes making an adjustment. And here's another opportunity, again, to look at this and say, the rest of, what does the rest of the day look like? It looks like 
okay, well, we have a meal bolus here and goes up and it comes back down. And the same thing here and the same thing here. There's a bolus for the meal, there's a bolus for the meal, there's a bolus for the meal. But guess what's happened here? Every time there's a meal, the system on top of the bolus, the system actually increases the basal tremendously to give you some extra insulin here before it, it, it goes back down to you know, target. And the same thing happened here again. Here's the meal bolus and then increase the basal a lot. A meal bolus and increase the basal a lot to cover this meal here, suggesting that the insulin to carb ratio is not enough. So basal rate is not enough and insulin to carb ratio needs adjustment as well. And we make those changes. And then we go back and look at it. Oh, one more thing. Uh, an indication here, again, we talked about this, that it's, it's a 56% basal, meaning that all of these additional uh, deliveries of basal, they're really actually uh, accounting for not enough insulin for the carbs, and that's why it's giving you more. And that's why when you, you know, this is an indicator, again, being this high, 56 versus 44 bolus, that we need to increase your boluses a little bit. Um, he, here's a, just a quick example of one who started on loop. And I can tell you just looking at this, look how much changes and adjustments the basal is having to do throughout the entire day. There isn't a single half hour with just the set basal. It's either more basal or less basal all day long and still running high most of the time and going up and down, up and down, up and down all day. So this is a patient who started on loop without optimizing their settings. And this is hopefully an example that, that, that will illustrate one of my passion pleads to everyone is that before starting any closed loop system, uh, do a little bit of adjustments for just one to two weeks up to optimize the settings, especially the basal rate settings, before we actually start looping or doing any automated insulin delivery. I mean, this, this just needs adjustment of everything because it's clearly not working. Um, all right, I think we're gonna skip this one and skip this one. We're going to talk about the successful looping at night, not enough insulin to carb ratio. So again, this looks nice and green for the whole night, not because of our basal settings are correct, but because loop is doing its thing and it's making a lot of adjustments and keeping it nice and green here. And if I see that there's a lot of work being done here, again, night after night after night, we go back and look at it. Um, and then we make those adjustments. And one thing to notice, this is an unusual patient who requires very, very little basal rate right here uh, between midnight and 5 a.m., 6 a.m. And again, illustrating that this nadir that we talked about in the pattern, that the lowest basal being between 1 and 3 a.m., isn't for everyone. The younger the patients, the longer this nadir period will be. It's not just 1 to 3 a.m. It can extend all the way from midnight to 5 a.m., being at a very low basal rate and then suddenly jumps between five and six and seven a.m. And you gotta do that gradually. And it's a big, big change here between the, the lowest and the highest here for some of these very young toddlers. All right, this is successful looping. Again, there's another, the same patient, same example, uh, and, and just not enough insulin for the carbs. Once he starts eating, the more he eats, the higher he goes. And we just need to be more aggressive with the carb ratio here and give him more insulin for the carbs. Even though there are policies for every single carbs he eats, and he eats a lot, but maybe he's eating a lot because he's running high and not getting enough insulin for the carbs. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think we're going to end up with um, this example of loop is working hard. And what I, what I mean by that here, now that we have a sense of what these means, look at this one again. So yes, it's actually starting at midnight being high. Loop is working to increase the basal and bring it down to target and then keeping it in the target range for the rest of the night until she wakes up. But guess what? This is just too much work. And again, for most people who look at this and they say, it's working, it's all green, it's night in range, there's no red, there's no hypoglycemia, and it's very well. And so the system is working well. I look at this and I say, actually, 
the system is really working too hard and I need to make those adjustments. If I'm asking the, this, the engineered system to do this much every single night, then why shouldn't I actually help it by saying, look, your, your baseline basal should not be down here and having to double it every night. Your baseline basal should be up here. And then well, all I ask you is to make a small change in it to fine tune it up and down 20%, 30% to keep this nice and steady for the night. I think it will perform much better that way. And that's where we start making those adjustments. Same thing here, again, night after night, we see that it's working a lot. Throughout the day, throughout the evening, nighttime, after bedtime here, again, having to increase the basal rate so much every single day. And we make the adjustments, and after we make some adjustments a week or two later, guess what? Let's take a look at this. I'm gonna go back one slide and just so that we can sort of make a, a, a mental image of what this looks like and then what this looks like. This is now set basal rates that are working on their own with minimal intervention from loop. It's only increasing the basal just a little bit, sorry, just a little bit here and increasing it a little bit here, decreasing it a little bit here. And the rest of the time is just running on basal rate that we eventually figured out after a few days of trying this and trying that and fine tuning it. And look at the days that we get here. We obviously get much higher percent in range, 88%. And we only need to work on peaks like this. Not maybe it's missed carb counting or missed bolus for something or something else. But this is what I would look like, what it, what it would look like after making some fine tuning adjustments. Again, several days in a row with minimal intervention, what I call minimal intervention by loop, uh, if we do our job right. Same thing. And guess what? Um, two weeks later, we start seeing the trend of blood sugar going up here. Blood sugar going up here. So it's not going up too much. It's still green. It's still in the range. But they were starting to see a subtle trend because this is a teenager who is starting puberty. And I expect that her blood sugars are going to start rising and her insulin requirements are going to start rising. And if we don't keep up with it, she's going to end up high later with a higher A1C or lower time and range. All of a sudden, if you, that's why reviewing the data every couple of weeks or every three to four weeks and making adjustments, especially in those who are entering puberty because they can change so fast. I think we can make a dent by anticipating what they need ahead of time and staying ahead of the curve, if you will. All right, for the sake of time, because I really would rather actually answer your questions, uh, we're gonna skip that last one and then go to the, our summary. Uh, with CGM data, I hope that I've convinced you that we don't really need basal testing in the, in the old way we, we used to think about basal testing from pre-CGM era. Uh, review of detailed daily views can be full of information. And again, not just looking at the AGP or the trends view or the compilation of things. Going through each and every day, hour by hour, for just three or four or five nights in a row and, and looking at the nighttime basal, that is going to be the most important. It's going to inform the daytime basal as well. And even with automated insulin delivery, we still need to review and optimize the settings because it's important to do that. And I hope that I've convinced you that it's important to continue to do that. Uh, and, the, and, and actually somebody who is on a closed loop, we can take advantage of what the system is actually delivering, that the actual basal delivery after it made the adjustments is going to actually tell us what the basal rate should be as opposed to making a wild guess or a informed guess. We can look at the actual delivery of basal insulin uh, over several days in a row and you say, that's what your basal should look like. And don't forget the patterns. Now I have a confession. I don't do basal testing anymore. I actually, with all my patients, when they ask me, they say, I got plenty of data I can take a look at and take advantage of it. You don't really need to do the so-called basal testing, meaning what we used to do, which is don't eat any carbs for breakfast for three days in a row and see what your basal rate is doing, or don't eat any carbs for dinner for three days in a row. 
to see what your basal rate is doing. I really don't think that we need to put the children through that anymore and the parents because they, it's the parents who deal with their kids who are hungry and want to eat something. Uh, I don't think that we, that's, that's totally important. And finally, for those who are going to leave us, uh, I put my email address there and I'm totally happy for anyone who wants to send me a direct email and ask any question or any explanation or even an argument uh, about what I said today and, and, and teach me a little bit more about what I do, uh, I'll be more than happy to take your emails. Thanks, Christopher. Alrighty. As my neighbor has started to uh, break out the weed whacker and edger across the street, um, I think at this point we can actually, Sal, you want to take down your screen share and we can have ourselves a little bit of a conversation now. Um, here is what we're going to do. It's been an hour. Thank you, everybody. Um, we've got 19 questions in. I'd like to answer them now. The session is, is being recorded. It will continue to be recorded. We will share the uh, archive version on our YouTube channel if you have to leave now. Um, and we'll get to you uh, later, but we will publicly share this webinar as with all of our other webinars on our YouTube channel. We can go from there. Um, I'm just going to run through a bunch of these questions right now, and we're going to just run it till the wheels fall off. Um, Sally, how are you good for like another 15, 20 minutes? I'm good for the next all hour, right. if you want. Um, okay, we're not going to be here that long because I've got other meetings <laughs> too. Um, all right, so there were a bunch of questions that came in, um, and I probably should have actually grouped the names, but ultimately the question was, um, is Tidepool going to be providing some sort of um, optimization experience, settings optimization experience through Tidepool Loop? Um, out, uh, from at launch, no. Uh, long term, our data science team would absolutely love to make yes, that happen. We're, we're working hard with the data science team on, on developing those kinds of guidelines and issues, uh, and we would love to make that happen, but it's going to take, uh, it's going to take time. Yeah, getting that right is going to be uh, incredibly complex, but it is something that I would look forward to. Uh, I would, I, I do look forward to us talking more about in the future as we have something more concrete to talk about. So it is, again, as mentioned, something absolutely planned to address uh, in the future. Um, and now to some of the more specific questions. Um, this one came in from Anonymous. Thank you, Anonymous. I'm not sure how Anonymous got in because I thought everybody had to register for this. But anyway, um, what should be done uh, if the 670 closed loop system can't adjust the Bayes rate enough to overcome Dawn phenomenon? Um, there are a couple of different questions that came in around addressing the Don Fromm scenario, and I feel like you did a pretty, pretty, you did a really good job of, of identifying how to identify those trends. But when it comes to working within um, limitations, if you want to call them that, of, of the closed loop systems in particular, how do you sort of work within what, what the technology can and can't do when it comes to identifying optimization opportunities? Yeah, I think I think that the, it's it's a good question, and unfortunately, um, I, I don't have the right answer for it. But if I if I am understanding this correctly, the 670G is the one system that does not rely on the basal settings. It actually does its own decision every five minutes, and uh, so whether you make an adjustment in the basal rate, it doesn't matter. It's just going to do its thing. And unfortunately, 670G was developed uh, very conservatively, so it's not aggressive enough and it's not ahead enough of the curve to actually make a dent in that morning rise, the dawn effect, and it's, in, and it's not very effective at that time, unfortunately. Uh, so um, I don't know if I have a real answer for that. Uh, you know, perhaps the systems that rely on basal rate and make an adjustment on that might be more effective for the dawn effect. Got it. Um, question from Ron. I actually had a couple in here, but we're going to start with this one. Um, with respect to DIY loop or any automated insulin um, delivery system, as you're evaluating um, the basal bolus ratio, are you still targeting a 50 50 um, percentage breakdown whenever you are um, trying to get to um, optimization of settings? Um, I, I would say, again, de de depending on the age, uh, I would go for whatever I expect that the basal percentage to be for that age group. Uh, like I said, for most, it's going to be 50-50. For most adolescents, it's going to be more like 45 to 50 of okay. basal. And for the younger children, it's going to be much less than that. So uh, it's starting with the toddlers being at 20 to 25% and gradually increasing to 30, 35, 40, 45%. Got it. Um, question from Anonymous. Thank you, Anonymous. Um, when it comes to traditional and traditional, for most patients that are uh, on insulin pump, they're usually going to be using something like Humalog or, um, or Novolog. What about patients that are on FIASP and they're pumping? Um, how do you adjust your approach to settings optimization knowing that they're going to be using insulin that's going to be acting a lot faster? That's, that's a great question. And the answer is, it's not a lot faster. 
is actually a little faster uh, okay. so that the, 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 the difference in, in the timing would be only by, uh, you know, maybe five to 10 minutes in terms of instead of, in, in, instead of looking back one hour and making an adjustment in the basal rate, I would look back maybe 45 to 50 minutes and making an adjustment in the basal rate. But in practical terms, you know, it's not going to make that much of a difference. We're not going to see that granularity uh, in, in the basal settings or in the CGM readings. Uh, I think the, the most it makes sense uh, for uh, FIASP is that, is that the peak after a meal, that's where the effect is, but not necessarily in the basal rate. It doesn't actually change the way I think about basal rate. Got it. A uh, question from Bill. Thank you, Bill. Um, what is the average weight of adults that, you, that were used in the median basal rate slide? Isn't body weight the variable that drives basal rate the most? I'll take the first part of that. Um, we don't actually store body weight in tide pool. There's a setting within the basics view where you can, um, I can actually show it to you, but there's a setting within the basics view where you can put in your weight and see the ratio of insulin to body weight, but we don't actually store that within tide pool. So as a result, we don't have that as a reference point for the analysis that we shared. Um, so that's sort of where we are right then in, in terms of what that analysis was presenting. It, 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 there is sort of a, um, not a bias, but uh, a caveat of weight is not a factor um, in terms of the analysis that we were presenting around the total daily insulin or basal bolus break or anything like that. Um, but then to you, Dr. D, how do you work with, um, or how, how does weight factor into the, the optimization sort of process and settings adjustments that you would recommend for your patients? You, you yeah, sort of talked about yeah. this a little bit, but I think yeah, it's be a yeah. No, for, about it. For, for the data that we showed uh, in those in those bar graphs, the four bar graphs, if you if you look at the second and the fourth one where we showed the same data with the, with the gray bars, and you can see that there was uh, there was a, a lot of uh, a lot of variance uh, and a wide range of those numbers. And that's why I think that you know, some of that is actually coming from the weight of the patient as well as their sensitivity or resistance to insulin. That's why that you know, 0 0.9 unit an hour is only the median. There were a lot of people who are taking 0 0.5 and 0 0.6 and a lot of people who are taking 1.8 and 1.9 unit an hour. And, and, and weight and, uh, and, and exercise and activity certainly has a lot to do with it. Yeah. Um, Jessica had written in with a couple of different questions. One was, um, uh, did you, it, it, with your experience, doctor, do you, have you noticed that women potentially have um, a significant difference in basal rates compared to men, obviously depending on age and puberty, like there are a lot of different factors there, but generally speaking, um, do you notice a difference between um, men and women uh, sort of at large um, when it comes to basal rates and, and settings optimization? Um, not, not at large as a general picture. I think there you are know, a couple of observations. One is that uh, during peak puberty, that 15, 16, 17, where the highest basal insulin requirement or highest insulin requirement is, that seems to be, first of all, higher in boys than it is in girls, so that the peak is much higher, uh, right. and also that it happens a little bit later. The peak in the peak insulin requirement in girls happened a little bit earlier, like about one to two years earlier. And, and, and that's easy to understand. They go through puberty about one to two years earlier than boys on average. Uh, the other factor is the, the menstrual cycle. And I think that's where it throws off a lot of things. We didn't, I didn't really press on that uh, much at all today, but um, it, it's, it's definitely another factor to take uh, into uh, 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 in, into the calculations and, and the interpretation of the data is making sure that we know when is the menstrual cycle and when is the mid-cycle, not just the menstruation, but also around the ovulation time. Because those two periods each month can have an effect on sensitivity and or resistance to insulin. And the basal rate can change up and down. So you wouldn't be looking at a time when she's having the menstrual cycle in the first three or four days and saying that's actually the time not to look at the basal rate because this is mm -hmm. not a representative of the true basal rate. But also to make sure that we're also looking at those two to three days around ovulation. Some women actually have heightened insulin sensitivity during those two or three days in the mid-cycle. They have a lot of hypoglycemia. Not all, some, not all. Uh, so it's one of those things that, again, we should ask about and specifically look at the CGM data, at the tight pool data during that time of the month to make sure that uh, what phenomenon do you fit in? Do you have lower insulin, uh, lower insulin needs during the ovulation? Do you have higher insulin needs during the menstrual cycle? 
And, and, and when does it start? One to two days before the cycle? How long does it last? Two to three days into the cycle or longer or shorter? Uh, all of those sort of, you know, nuances for each individual need to be noted. Right. Um, I feel like that would be an entirely, we could, maybe should have a webinar focused exclusively on that topic because that is a lot of variables that you consider there. It's, it's, yeah. Um, yeah. A uh, question from Michael. Thank you, Michael. If you exercise normally between 5 p.m. and 8 p.m., would the exercise have worn off by midnight and be good for looking at her basal rates? So you're that's talking a, about... Uh, yeah. I, I love this question. Uh, and I think uh, because I, I meant to actually discuss it, we just didn't have the time. And the answer is, you remember that young man who who had a low blood, who had a, a dropping blood sugar all night for four nights in a row? Uh, so one can easily argue well, that maybe that's because he actually goes to the gym or goes for a long run right before dinner or, or you know, late dinner, uh, late in the evening, he goes to do that. And the answer is, you're absolutely right. That could certainly be an effective exercise. So easy to just simply ask, is it, did you exercise in the evening? And if he says no, but even without that, usually in my experience that if there is an effect of late evening exercise, it's going to last all the way until the end of that nadir period after midnight, which is about two to 3 a.m. Usually uh, that's where it, it, it wears off. And after three or 4 a.m., the effect of exercise from the night before is almost all gone. So you're gonna see a drop in blood sugar until about 3 a.m. And after that, it starts to rise or it does whatever it does. And if it continues to drop, that means it's not the exercise. It's actually the, the basal rate itself. Got it. Uh, following up on that, Jessica had a comment about seeing, uh, about the effect of exercise and seeing that within Typepool. Um, so currently we are, we are collecting exercise and activity data from Apple Health into your Typepool account. We are not yet displaying it. What you can do in the meantime is use Typepool Mobile to make notes to document your exercise. I document my dog walks for Dr. Adi to, um, to review and remind me that I need to be using the exercise activity setting on my insulin pump because the dog walk that I go on um, is quite dramatic in terms of its effect on my blood glucose. But you can use notes within Tidepool to document your exercise and use that as a review point to go back um, and identify one, the effect of exercise immediately, but then two, as a reference point for looking at your basal rates and your insulin um, and your blood glucose trends and things like that after that exercise point based off of the note that you're making within Tidepool. Um, and Christopher, if I may, just to point out that you know, by doing that, by you making a note of what time do you go for a dog walk uh, and uh, looking at tight pool, we actually discovered that just the dog walk that you do, or the, that the walk that you do with your dog, it actually drops your blood sugar a minimum of 100 points. Uh, and, we, and, and then we have to make an adjustment for that. Just one more reason that dogs are pretty great. Uh, question in from Carl. Uh, as an adult, thank you, Carl. As an adult, uh, should you adjust um, your settings one hour before the drop or peak, or is it or the two hour window so are more appropriate? So when you were talking about adjusting based off of a trend that you see, go back this amount of time and adjust the base rate. Um, is one hour for adults, two hours for adults? What sort of window are you looking for when you're considering an adult patient? I, I would go one hour for adults. Uh, for, for children, maybe a little bit less because the insulin duration is a little shorter because their insulin doses are much smaller. Uh, and, and, and in my experience, that the smaller the dose, the shorter the insulin duration. But for most adults, I would go for one hour and then continue to look and make notes and, and continue to look at the, uh, at, at the CGM tracing and say, uh, just fine tune it. You can certainly go into three hours. I know, for example, the the, uh, the tandem and the Medtronic pump can actually uh, do, you know, uh, at the 30 minute interval or at the 15 minute interval. You don't necessarily have to do 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 8 a.m. You can certainly do 6.15 or 6.30 or 6.45. If you, by the way, give me insulin pump settings at 6.15 and 6.30, I think we're <laughs> going to have to have a focused conversation. I, I, I respect your many, many years of experience, but I, mm, I don't know if I'm going to be changing my settings every 15 minutes. That seems like I feel like that's a lot. That's no, a whole no, it's separate. Not, it's not, it's not every 15 though. minutes, but it, instead of starting at 6 a.m., starting at 6.30. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, I see that. If there were some sort of fixed point. Okay. I'll give you that one. <laughs> we can agree <laughs> on that one. Yeah. All, right. Um, all right. Question in from James. Uh, if you're looking at the optimal number, then that 3 a.m. window that you were talking about from the nighttime to apply to the daytime, does that mean that you're looking at what your blood sugar is doing at 3 a.m.? Or is it... Um, looking at what your blood sugar is doing one to two hours later. Um, so again, looking at the 
the insulin that's being delivered at that time, that basal setting then, are you looking at that specific delivery and value then in there? Or are you looking at the delivery at 3 a.m. and the impact one or two hours yeah, later? Yeah, no, thank you very much for this question because it needs to be clarified. What we're really looking at is looking at the CGM data. So when I say that the, that the, the nadir of insulin requirement is between 1 and 3 a.m., it's actually between midnight and 2 a.m. That's for, you know, when we're thinking about the insulin itself. Uh, so, uh, so looking at CGM data of, of seeing that the, uh, that, that, that the nadir insulin requirement at between 1 and 3 a.m. Uh, means that your body really actually needs less insulin, not at 1 to 3, it's more like at 2 to 4. We're delivering the, the lowest insulin at 1 to 3 because your body needs the lowest insulin at 2 to 4. And I hope this makes sense. Got it. Um, question from Anonymous, is the analysis software public now? Um, Anonymous, I think you might be asking about the data that Dr. Adi presented at the beginning around the insulin delivery. And the answer is that analysis is um, publicly available. If you go to typepool.org slash blog, um, our data science team has published a number of, um, uh, of blog posts and articles, um, including all the graphs um, around that analysis. So you can see all those lovely charts um, that are in there for yourself. We actually will be sending out a link to um, that insulin analysis blog post that Dr. McGee referenced as a follow-up to this webinar. So thank you for that anonymous. Um, question in from, where was my next favorite one? Um, here we go. Another one, actually another one from anonymous saying that the need to look um, at 30 or 90 days of data has been exposed as bunk. Thank you, Dr. Adi, you are right. Um, just a few days of data will usually show key trends for basal adjustments. And I think the question that I wanna use as a follow-up to that, not just to compliment and commend you, um, is um, how, how little data do you require, do you feel is necessary to make um, an effective adjustment, even if it is just trying to find the right setting, knowing that there's going to be a multi-step process? Yeah. Um, like how, how, how much, how little data do you feel comfortable um, using as a, as a reference or as, as the justification for a decision you want to make or recommend to your patient? So seven days. I think if, if, if we factor in, if, I, if I'm confident that the seven days is a representative week, uh, it's not something that there's something else that's happening. Uh, there's no illness. There's no menstrual cycle. There's no travel. There's no change in exercise routine. Uh, and if, I, if the patient tells me that th this is a kind of a typical week, then I say more, you know, I don't need more than seven days to look at and start actually fine. And, 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 and by the way, it's very common that I look at seven days and I say, I just can't see anything. In the it's just so different every single day. And it's okay to say, I don't see anything. Let's just wait another week and look at the data back again. Mm -hmm. uh, it's perfectly fine. We don't have to do that. And then the other principle when we're making those changes and looking at the data, don't try to fix everything all at once. Just pick one thing. And usually I start with the basal rate for the nighttime. That's the first thing that I do. And then once we get that you know, fixed and, and close to being where it should be, then it's a lot easier to start looking at the insulin to carb ratio and the ISF, and et cetera, et cetera, and start talking about strategies for the exercise and heavy meal and extended boluses, this and that. Gotcha, cool. Um, a question uh, from James, uh, noting that you, thank you, James, that you had began this, pre began this presentation talking about um, the different basal rate sort of patterns um, for different age groups. Um, and the question is, if you could summarize that in a sentence or two, I feel like the better opportunity is, can we just get those slides or get, that, get those images and put them into a blog post so we can summarize um, later on for, for future reference? I feel like that might be a better way forward. Are you down to help me write a blog post, Dr. Adi? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and we can certainly disseminate that. Uh, that's a great idea. And, and we can make the slides available for everyone. Awesome. Uh, question in from a different James. This is actually talking about DIY, DIY loop settings, um, but I think this can still apply to um, a variety of automated slum delivery systems. So we can sort of navigate that one, talk, saying that you can set very narrow target ranges with some systems, I guess with only one do-it-yourself system currently. Um, since the standard basal testing, um, as he understands it, with the rate okay, um, I'm going to read this as it is, and we're going to sort of figure out the question here. Since with standard basal testing, as I understand it, the rate is okay with a plus or minus 30 point range, um, Loop will always adjust, um, will always make minor basal adjustments if the target range is set very narrow. Um, so I guess the, my interpretation of that is um, knowing that DIY Loop and other and different automated systems are going to be treating their the data that they're coming in differently. Um, how how precise are your optimizations of changes and recommendations 
based off of the specific nature of the automated system as opposed to um, insulin is insulin and you just need to make sure that the settings are in a good place. Like, do you, yeah. do you make um, adjustments for a patient um, on a 670 that would be specific to that just because that's how the 670 is or for, for me on control IQ, for a patient on DIY loop, how, how much does the system itself factor into the settings optimization changes that you're recommending for your patients? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to assume that I understand the question and, or, or I should say that I'm going to appropriately provide the right answer. But if not, I'm happy again, you have it in my email listed at the right. end and hopefully you can shoot me an email. Um, but um, it's, it's a really good question because uh, if I, I start with the range being 70 to 180 and, 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 and if you're in DIY loop, and the range is too tight, then loop is going to make finer adjustments more often. And then you're gonna end up not knowing, is this making the finer adjustments because it's really needed or is because I'm targeting such a tight range? Uh, so I would say if you're doing that sort of exercise of basal testing and optimization, maybe this is time to widen the range, relax it a little bit for just a few days, like three or four or five days in a row. And just, let's just see if the basal rate is working and you staying in that range. And then we can fine tune it a little bit later if you want a flatter line within the range. Uh, but the other part of this is related to the other system, like the 670G and even the Control IQ from Tandem, for example. The Control IQ does not have a range. It's actually targeting 112.5. And anytime it goes below or it tries to push us back up, uh, so even though it's not necessarily waiting for the suspend threshold, but even if it's a blood sugar of 100 or 99, it's going to actually make an adjustment. So again, we have to look at that and say, was it making the adjustments simply because uh, it's below 112.5? And what would it have done if, if the range was really between 80 and 140? Uh, so I would ignore those minor adjustments because looking at the CGM tracing, it's going to look like it's pretty darn flat with just some noise up and down, but they're mm -hmm. minor little sinus adjustments going up and down. They're not the dramatic one. So I would just simply ignore those mentally and say, no, this is just an adjustment because it doesn't like 100. It wants it to be 112. And I would just completely ignore that. Got it. I feel like that. I feel like that addressed the, the sort of the spirit of the question that was asked. So thank you for that one question from Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Um, how long after you make basal changes, do you see results? Um, do you need to try? Um, yeah. So how long after making a change to, um, to a basal rate, do you wait for a, a new round of data to come in to inform a new potential decision that you're making around optimization? I, I think I think two to three days uh, you will start seeing a change, uh, but I wouldn't make another adjustments two or three days later. I think you want to give it a little bit of time because you don't know what other factors may have influenced things. So make sure that you have a consistent result. And I would say, make a change, limit your change. If you're not certain, oh, absolutely limit your change to 10 to 20% change, increase or decrease wait a week, come back, look at the data again, make another change. If you do that, you're going to be very safe. You're not going to cause any harm, neither hyper or hypoglycemia, and you're going to be okay. Uh, and then just five to seven days later, make another assessment and, and make another adjustment and then give it a try again. Cool. It's kind of uh, fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I would kind of hope it is if you've been doing this for as long as you have. Um, yeah. So James has actually come back in to sort of clarify his question. He's asking around the same overall daily pattern. He's saying, are, are those patterns that you identified, are they typical across childhood and adult age ranges? Um, I feel like I have an answer to this, but you're the, you're the doctor here. Um, when it comes to that, like, you know, zero to six, six to 12, 12 to 18, 18 and beyond, you're showing the sort of general patterns there. Um, but they are general patterns, right? Like, I mean, with each individual patient, you don't have to take into their, Absolutely. take into account their individual scenarios, but Absolutely. do you use those general patterns as like a starting point for like, I'm going to start here and see where you, where you do and don't apply to the, to the general pattern that you're familiar with? Yes. Um, okay. you, you start with a pattern, assuming a normal weight, a normal diet and a normal bedtime and wake up time. And then you take that and you say, this is what I predict your baseline, your basal pattern should look like. 
This is where I predict your values should be at based on your age and pubertal status. And then start from there and then make adjustments as we go because individually it's gonna vary. But the, the first part of the question is, it's, it's really a dynamic pattern. So you got the pre, that's why I, I narrowed it down to the pre-pubertal and then post-pubertal patterns. Uh, so the pre-pubertal pattern and then the post-pubertal pattern and if you actually put them next to each other, you will see that the peak at dawn is very similar. The nadir at 1 to 3 a.m. is very similar. And the difference is that first part of the night, having a peak in the pre-pubertal children and not having a peak in the post-pubertal children. But that transition from the pre-pubertal to the post-pubertal is a gradual one, and it actually changing almost on a yearly basis. It's just a slight shift in the peaks up and down and slight shift in the insulin requirements going up every year or every few months for that matter uh, for each patient. Uh, so it's really, it's, it's, a, it's a dynamic process and uh, I wish we had a, a methodology for it. Uh, and maybe, maybe eventually we can, this is a, not a bad project. Yeah. A uh, question from Anonymous. Thank you, Anonymous. Why should the basal bolus uh, breakdown be 50-50? Why, um, why not have the basal be over 50%? Like in, in terms of your targeting, why not target 60% um, for a basal for a total daily dose? Like, What, what is it about the 50-50 breakdown that is so optimal in your opinion? It's, it's, it's optimal because of two, two reasons. One is that it's the observation that this is what most people actually do uh, when they end up in a good place in terms of good blood sugar control. Uh, they end up requiring roughly about 50% basal. And then the other is from studies that look at people who are just simply fasting and not eating anything and, and seeing how much their own insulin, people without diabetes, how much of their own insulin that they're making. And it and it turned out that it's roughly about 40 to 50%. Okay. Um, I feel like we've got thunderstorms that are like literally rolling in as we're doing this. So we're going to try and power through. I got a couple of typo interface questions um, from Rhonda and from Anonymous. Um, really quick. Um, so Rhonda's question was, how do I read basal delivery or basal rate in tandem pump history? Does the number mean that it's the exact rate being delivered or is that how much is being raised or lowered? So in terms of what the tandem pump is displaying or is telling you in the pump history, um, I know this because I'm using AT Slim. That's what was actually delivered. Um, you can compare that with your basal profile and see what was scheduled versus what was actually delivered and see if that was an increase or a decrease. Uh, within Tidepool, however, you can also just simply look at your basal profile and see here is scheduled basal delivery because it is a solid line and you can see what was scheduled here, 0.85 units. This is actually my data. The dotted line indicates that there was an adjustment to your basal delivery. So the dotted line here, um, the temporary basal, so the scheduled basal rate was 0.7 units per hour, but there's a temporary basal set of zero. So my insulin was actually fully suspended there for that moment. And then over here, here's an increase. So again, 0.8 units was scheduled represented by that dotted line. When you hover over this, you can see the temporary basal amount was increased to 155% of doubling for that little moment right there because this was part of an auto bolus. Thank you, Control IQ. Um, another question in from Anonymous was, what, does the, what do the S and Rs represent in uh, Tide Pool whenever you're seeing that data in the basal display? That represents a suspend and resume. I don't actually have that here because I'm on Control IQ. If you see an S that represents a suspend, and R represents an automatic resume, and that's the system handling that themselves. Um, Dr. Uh, Christ, D showed that in the slides. From yeah, before Christopher, well. that's, that's the S and the R are for the people who are using basal IQ, but not control right. IQ. So if you use or, basal so IQ. So the 670 it, also includes that as well. We it, 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 you're right, you're right, you're right. Yeah. Um, so that is that. All right. Um, Question from Michael. Uh, in Tide Pool, when, when I'm in auto mode, it shows the basal rates every five minutes and I have to put my mouse over that basal profile as we just as I just showed you to see the actual amount that was delivered and write that down in order to be able to use an exact amount for the hour. Um, so his question is sort of a feature request and we're gonna get to something I think that you can address, Dr. D. The question is, is it possible to show a half hour average rate in Tide Pool or an, or an hourly average rate of basal delivery in Tide Pool? Not yet. Um, I'm gonna document that and bring that on to the design and product teams for consideration. Thank you for that. Um, and then I think the more more sort of valuable in the moment question for you, Dr. D, is knowing that you have systems out there that are adjusting insulin delivery as often as every five minutes, that's a lot more data for you to consider in terms of settings optimization. So how do you adjust or how do you take in that? What do you do to evaluate that data? Whenever you see the CGM line as your first point of reference, but then you see the basal delivery that is adjusting every five minutes, um, how do you 
how do you take that data in from the insulin side of things and, and use that to identify where you can make the changes and improvements for settings optimization? Yeah, yeah. Not, not every five minutes. If it's making a change, obviously, and even if, if it's 15 minutes, I usually look at the 30 minutes to 60 minutes kind of average. What did it do? Uh, did it, uh, let me see if I can, if I can go there. Uh, let's see, where is share screen? I'm gonna share the screen. While he's looking, I'm gonna address one more quick question from Anonymous, what microphone are you using, Chris? This is a Yeti Pro USB. I actually need to turn on the light, hang on one second. This is a Yeti Pro from Blue. I love these microphones, they're really great. They are not paying to sponsor me for this. I just really believe in it. I used to be a podcaster in a former life. Dr. D, go ahead. Um, okay, you can see my screen, right? Yep. Um, so, so, so basically what I do is, you know, go back, where, where are we here? Uh, go back, for example, to this one. And we look at this and we say, okay, this is a pretty good, uh, pretty good sensor reading tracing for the whole night. And that's working very well, but look what's happening here. We're gonna see that there's almost an hour and a half with zero basal here. And you actually hover over it, it tells you exactly when it started, like 314, 359, 419, and it ended up at 430. So this is an hour and 15 minutes with zero basal, uh, preceded by this much basal, 0.38, and preceded by 0.3 for about, I can't calculate it, like an hour and a half, and then followed by another hour, 0.27, and then zero basal here for about 20 minutes, and then 0.26 or 0.27 for another hour, 15 minutes or an hour and 10 minutes. And I take all of this and say, what's my average basal rate here really? Is it 0.3? Is it 0.2? No, it's actually, you know, it's, it's shutting off the basal for almost one third of the time in this period of time. So instead of 0.27 and 0.3, I'm actually going to go down to 0.2 and 0.15 and try that kind of pattern because I see this is happening every night. I mean, you can go through other days and see if the same thing is happening, but this is how I calculate what the actual basal requirement should look like and then go down. So it's not by five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And eventually I agree with you. I would love for tight pool to be able to show that in this period of time, whatever I define by myself and say in this period of time, the, the, the loop had to increase your basal X percent of the time and X mm -hmm. percent of insulin that, that was delivered above what your basal rate settings are. And showing that on a day to day, I mean, every day, every day, every day, showing the same thing consistently and then averaging out all of that, that that's already given me what the basal rate should really look like. And I can do it on an hourly basis. And that way I don't have to do any math. The system will actually basically tell you what your basal rate, what the actual basal delivery really is without you having to do any calculation. And I think we're gonna to get to that point. Cool. Um, all right, I wanna do two more questions and then we're gonna get out of here. One is from James following up on the plus or minus 30 points comment. I'm going to read it in full because it actually is quite detailed. Thank you for this, James. Um, what I meant by the plus or minus 30 points thing is that I've been told that if my blood glucose does not deviate more than plus or minus 30 points during a given basal set program or a scheduled period, then my basal is set correctly. However, with DIY loop, my target is set to 1995. So loop makes basal adjustments to hit that target. So it seems like I will always have minor adjustments to the temporary basal rate, even if I have my basal set correctly. Um, there's a lot there, but that first point around that plus or minus 30 points, um, like I guess how much deviation do you consider to be acceptable whenever you are evaluating um, whether or not um, settings are optimized? That's, that's a really hard question, you know, addressing the issue of glucose variability. Uh, so are we going for a normal blood sugar for a person who does not have type one diabetes, who's running all night at 90 plus minus five, uh, that's the sort of, you know, normal physiology. Are we aiming for the same kind of pattern? And I think that would be really hard. 
uh, for someone who has type 1 diabetes because the insulin that we deliver is just too slow and we don't have anything to counteract it. We don't have glucagon and insulin working together. Remember, from an engineering point of view, if you want a system that delivers a steady output completely, uh, you have to give it two ways of adjusting it. If it goes up, you bring it down. If it goes down, you bring it up. Otherwise, if it goes up, you bring it down and you kind of have to wait for the reaction. And, and so it doesn't really work with a single direction measure. You have to have both direction uh, controlled. <clears throat> so what is the optimal plus and minus variability? I don't think anybody knows the answer to that. But in my mind, the closer we get to normal, that's at least our goal in everything we do in type 1 diabetes management, is that we're going to be as, or we're going to aim for as close to normal as possible within the safeties and the capabilities that we have. Uh, so the, the, the less variability, the better, but plus and minus 30, I think it's perfectly okay. Uh, however, uh, I would say if you're seeing a lot of gyrations because it's really targeting that 95 target, I believe that even in DIY loop, you can set a range, not necessarily a single number. So you can set your range to be between 90 and 140, and then anything in, at, at 140, uh, anything in that range, is, it's going to leave it alone. Am I correct? Yeah, I, I think that for any of those, for, for that, we're getting into DIY territory, but I feel like... Um, the challenge you're going to see for somebody that is targeting, even for somebody to control IQ, if they're targeting a super tight range, um, then settings are always going to be something that you're going to need to fiddle with. Like if your target is 90 to 95 in a DIY system, or you're always running sleep mode in control IQ, um, like trying to get something that precise, that consistently across a 24 hour period, I feel like that's a different sort of mentality and approach you have to take to your settings optimization approach. Sorry. So, so, so if you have a tight range, widen it. And if you have a single target in loop, uh, try to have a target range instead and make it a little bit wider. You know, say it's 80 to 150 or 160, or even go to 70 to 180, which is kind of the standard target range, if you will, for a few yeah. days and see if you get a smoother line down. For a few days. Okay. That's, that's the thing. I feel like if, if, if you're recommending that sort of wider range, I feel like that's sort of, I imagine you would get responses that would say that that's defeating the purpose of these closed loop systems if you're allowing for, that. But if you're using for, for that as, as an upper, For a few right. days, for making adjustments and see where you are. And then, and, and I think that's going to help you stay in a tighter range. Got if it. you kind of just allow the system to be free of, of influences and make adjustments in your base rate to be just right. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, last question from Christopher, not me, um, asking about which pump would you recommend or which pump is best for a closed loop system. And I would actually purport to say, based off of this hour and a half we spent together, it doesn't matter what system you're using if your settings aren't in the right place. Um, I feel like that's, well, the, that, that's the most diplomatic <laughs> response I can give without getting anybody <laughs> uh, too upset. So again, based off of, again, this past 90 minutes, hopefully this is establishing a great foundation for you, for your patients, for your kid, for whoever. Um, to identify how to approach settings optimization, not, not basal testing, not just basal testing, settings optimization, get those settings in the right place, and then the technology can ultimately succeed uh, or, is it, or ultimately is in a better place to succeed. Um, there's something of a wrap up there, I feel like was in a good position there. Uh, Dr. Adi, thank you for spending quite a bit of time with me today. I know My pleasure. I have a better appreciation for why they call you the basal whisperer because you can talk about this all day. And this has been a lot of fun. Thank you very much, Christopher. And thank you all for hanging out. Uh, I, I see we have 35 people still. Uh, still. <laughs> uh, and uh, g give us your feedback. Give us your suggestions. Uh, and uh, maybe we can uh, come up with another webinar sometime soon and, and continue this conversation. Definitely. Have a great day, everybody.